Hey everybody, Daniel from Space Dock here, and today marks 50 years since the launch of Apollo 11 on 16th of July 1969. In honor of that incredibly important moment in human history, we have put together this special extended Space Dock episode. This fantastic script was provided by the Sojourn Science Advisor Gabriel Fonseca in his professional capacity as a person who knows what he's talking about. Go and follow him on Twitter if you're interested, and I hope you all enjoy what we've got for you here in today's video. In the year 1957, during the height of the Cold War, for the first time, humanity launched an artificial object into Earth's orbit, Sputnik 1. Its launch would become known as the starting point of a clash of skill and technological ingenuity between the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics and the United States of America that would continue throughout the next two decades, the space race. After successfully launching the first artificial satellite, the USSR achieved other milestones in very quick succession, launching the first mammal into space, Laika, mere months after the launch of Sputnik 1, achieving the first flyby of the moon by the probe Luna 1 in 1959, and on April 12th of 1961, Yuri Alexievich Gagarin became the first human ever to venture into space, completing a full orbit before returning safely to Earth. The United States, not to be left behind, followed the Soviet launch with a satellite of their own, Explorer 1. But for every feat the US managed to match, the USSR were two steps ahead. This perceived disparity between US technology and that of the Soviet Union caused a great deal of unease among the American populace. And during the 1960s presidential elections, the Democrat Party's candidate promised to close this missile gap. Upon assuming office on January of 61, John Fitzgerald Kennedy was shown the early drafts of an ambitious new crewed spaceflight program laid down by the recently formed National Aeronautics and Space Administration, Project Apollo. Kennedy was hesitant to approve the project given the high costs involved, but Gagarin's spaceflight proved to be too impactful to ignore, asking his Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson to investigate what would be required for the US to catch up to the Soviets. The answer was clearly presented. A crewed lunar landing was far enough into the future that the United States could achieve it before the USSR. On May 25th, 1961, Kennedy announced before the US Congress his intention to place boots on the moon before the end of the decade. To achieve this monumental goal, a new state-of-the-art spacecraft would need to be developed, as well as a booster of unprecedented scale to carry this spacecraft into low Earth orbit. The NASA mission architects and engineers spent the next year analyzing a myriad of different approaches to land humans on the moon in the safest, quickest, and most economic way, before finally settling on a lunar orbit rendezvous mission profile. To achieve this mission, they would build two spacecraft, the Apollo Command and Service Module and the Lunar Excursion Module, that would be launched by a new booster of unprecedented size, power, and launch capacity, the Saturn V. The first stage of the Saturn V booster, known as the S-1C, stood at 42 meters tall and an impressive 10 meters in diameter. Able to produce an astounding 33,400 kilonewtons of force, it was powered by five Rocketdyne F-1 kerosene liquid oxygen engines. The four outermost engines were equipped with hydraulic actuators to allow for gimbling and better control of the rocket during the first 67 kilometers of the ascent phase. At launch, the Saturn V accelerated at 1.25 g, but as the the rapidly consumed propellant that made up more than three quarters of the rocket's launch mass was depleted, acceleration climbed to nearly 4G, at which point the central engine would be shut down to prevent extreme accelerations. 168 seconds into the launch, and at speeds in excess of 2,700 meters per second, after all engines had cut off, eight small solid fuel retro rockets, located in pairs at each of the four conical engine fairings at the stage's base, would fire in tandem with explosive bolts, separating the S1C from the rest of the Saturn V stack. After the interstage skirt was detached, the second stage's engines were ignited. With a height of 24.9 meters and 10 meters in diameter, the S2 also boasted five engines in a quincunx configuration, with the four outermost being articulated. But unlike the S1C, it was fueled by purely cryogenic propellants. Liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen fed the highly efficient Rocketdyne J2 engines, producing 4,400 kilonewtons of force, which propelled the Saturn V stack and its payload up to 
to 185 kilometers of altitude, 1,505 kilometers downrange of the launch site, and at a speed of 6,930 meters per second, having burned for 367 seconds. During the second stage burn, the Saturn would shift from a pre-programmed ascent trajectory into a dynamically calculated one, the onboard instrument unit determining the most efficient flight path toward the adequate parking orbit. Once the second stage has completed its burn and is within one kilometer per second of achieving orbital speed, the third stage springs into action. Three Ullage motors fire in tandem with explosive bolts, separating the 17.8 meter long and 6.6 meters in diameter S4B from the spent S2, upon which it ignites its single J2 Rocketdyne engine until orbital velocity has been achieved. Unlike the previous stages, the S4B was designed to allow its engine to be reignited, permitting the rocket to perform a translunar injection from its parking orbit instead of a direct transfer approach, which not only significantly expanded the rocket's launch window, but also allowed mission planners to evaluate if all systems were nominal for the monumental journey ahead. The S-4B also sported two auxiliary propulsion system modules, utilizing hypergolic fuels, which were fired before main engine reignition to settle the propellants. The APS also permitted three-axis attitude control, used to hold the stage's altitude during translunar docking maneuvers to retrieve its payload. To control it, the S-4B carried the Saturn V launch vehicle computer, manufactured by International Business Machines. With its 32 kilobytes of random access memory, it controlled all aspects of the flight until the S-4B had delivered its payload, after which it set the stage on a collision course with the moon. After the translunar injection burn and the ejection of the fairings covering the lunar module, the CSM was staged to then perform the transposition docking and extraction maneuver, flipping 180 degrees to then perform a rendezvous, attaching itself to the lunar module and then gently removing it from its cradle, forming the assembled Apollo spacecraft. 7.5 meters tall and 3.9 meters in diameter, the service module contained everything required to keep the three astronauts alive during their nearly 10-day mission. After being injected into its translunar trajectory, the Apollo spacecraft would use the service module's main engine to perform the capture and later departure burns to and from lunar orbit. As its main propulsion system, the SM boasted one Aerojet General AJ-10-137, which could produce an impressive 91 kilonewtons of force, more than twice the thrust required to accomplish its mission, as the engine was originally dimensioned to allow the CSM to take off from the lunar surface before the Lunar Orbit Rendezvous mission profile had been selected in late 1962. Its usage of storable hypergolic fuels allowed the engine to be ignited as many times as required, and without the concern of boil-off rates like the cryogenic propellants used in the upper stages of the Saturn V. These two attributes ensured its reliability to insert the spacecraft onto its return trajectory from the moon, after five days of elapsed mission time. Supplementing the main propulsion system was the service module's reaction control system, providing full six-axis rotational and translational control to the spacecraft, composed of 16 Marcad Corporation R4D nitrogen peroxide and monomethylhydrazine hypergolic thrusters, arranged in four quad-engine blocks spaced 90 degrees around the CSM's diameter. Each engine could produce 440 newtons of thrust. This suite of thrusters was key in allowing the CSM to perform the complex transposition, docking, and extraction maneuver, the Lunar Orbit Rendezvous, to retrieve the lunar module after its landing and allowing the fine control of the vessel's trajectory during its translunar phase. Powering both the service and command modules were three fuel cell power plants that combined oxygen and hydrogen to create electrical power and drinkable water that could be used by the astronauts. The cells were highly redundant. If two were rendered inoperable, the mission could be safely aborted using the single remaining cell. Supplementing them were three rechargeable batteries, with later CSM seeing the addition of an extra 400 ampere hour battery, which allowed the command module to maintain power for between five and ten hours in the eventuality of a total fuel cell failure. Of the many systems installed aboard the CSM, arguably the most vital was the environmental control system, tasked with providing a breathable atmosphere, water and waste management for the astronauts, and maintaining livable temperatures inside the crewed spaces of the spacecraft by utilizing two 2.9 square meter radiator panels near the service module's base. It was composed of five subsystems, the oxygen, pressure suit circuit, water, post-landing ventilation and water glycol subsystems. An umbilical connector linked the service module's systems to the command and module, the three astronauts home during their mission, providing it with the amenities of the service module. 
A truncated cone 3.23 metres tall and 3.91 metres in diameter, the command module was designed to decelerate and gently bring down its three passengers from a lunar transfer trajectory to a safe splashdown in the Atlantic Ocean. At the bottom of the command module was the ablative heat shield, with a thickness varying between 5.1 and 1.3 centimetres, composed of 1,400 kilograms of phenolic formaldehyde resin. The crew cabin that for most of the trip would house the three astronauts boasted 5.9 cubic metres of habitable space, it had three crew couches, the spacecraft control panels, and all of the conveniences required during the astronaut's journey, divided into six internal segments. Of special note was the navigation section, which contained the Apollo Guidance Computer, manufactured by the MIT Instrumentation Laboratory, and one of the very first integrated circuit digital computers. This revolutionary machine was able to handle all but the most complex flight operations the Apollo spacecraft could face in its mission. To allow the crew to land on the moon, however, the third component of the Apollo spacecraft was employed, the lunar module. Designed with the sole purpose of ferrying its two occupants from lunar orbit to the lunar surface, its two-stage design was entirely unconstrained by aerodynamic considerations, which yielded a craft unlike any seen before. After the mission computer and lunar module pilot embarked the LEM, it undocked from the SCM and lighted its first stage engine for its deorbit burn. At 3.29 meters high and weighing 10.3 tons when fueled, the descent module was powered by the TRW Incorporated Descent Propulsion System, more commonly known as DIPS, a throttleable hypergolic engine with a maximum thrust of 45 kilonewtons, able to throttle between 10% and 60% of its full thrust. This range of control was required to allow for a safe landing on the lunar surface surface, as despite the landing site having been selected long before the flight, the astronauts would be required to manually pick the final landing spot to avoid boulders, slopes, and other dangerous terrain. In between the four lander legs on the descent stage's octagonal prism-shaped main body were four modular bays that could carry different equipment according to the mission's needs, ranging from extended supplies, deployable cameras to film the astronauts' first steps on the moon, scientific experiments, and in later Apollo missions, a deployable lunar rover, a four-wheeled electric vehicle with enough battery life for a maximum of 92 kilometers. During the two astronauts' brief sojourn on the lunar surface, they would live inside the ascent module, 2.83 meters tall and with 4.5 cubic meters of habitable volume. It held enough supplies for a 48-hour stay, further extended to 75 on later missions. Once the excursion was completed, the ascent module would fire its single Bell Aerosystems ascent propulsion system engine, producing 16 kilonewtons of force, inserting the ascent module into lunar orbit, from where it would use its RCS system to rendezvous with the waiting CSM, dock, transfer crew, collected samples and experiments, and then be discarded before the CSM's return to Earth. The development of the Apollo program was an arduous and complicated endeavor, from the troubled start on the drawing boards to the tragic fire that claimed three astronauts' lives in the rehearsal test for Apollo 1, to the technical challenges that had to be surpassed and the ever-looming deadline set by President Kennedy. The Apollo program is a symbol of what people can achieve when working toward a common goal, no matter what the adversities may be. From 1966 to 1969, NASA tested its hardware closer and closer to achieving its goal, with Apollo 7 being the first crewed Apollo mission to space, Apollo 8 performing a flyby of the moon, and Apollo 9 and 10 testing the final hardware in preparation for the real goal. On July 16, 1969, Michael Collins, Edwin Buzz Aldrin, and Neil Armstrong climbed onto the sixth crewed Saturn V at Cape Canaveral. Four days later, on July 20th, 1969, as they were watched by five 500 million people across all the planet, and as countless more listened through the radio, Neil Armstrong descended the steps of the lunar module and became the first human to set foot on an alien world, soon joined by his colleague Buzz Aldrin. After proceeding with their immediate tasks, the two astronauts read aloud the small plaque affixed to the LEM's leg from the Sea of Tranquility, so that all could hear its words. Here men from the planet Earth set foot on the moon, July 1969. We came in peace for all mankind. In the 50 years since the first moon landing, the 12 Apollo astronauts remain the only humans to have ever set foot on a world beyond Earth. The moon still remains, ready for us to return. But during these same 50 years, humanity has sent probes even farther into our solar system. With each reaching further than the last, they have gazed ever deeper into the sky and found thousands of alien worlds, many possibly like our own home. And during these 50 years, working as one, humanity has established a permanent outpost in space, orbiting our home 16 times every day. Like the hundreds upon hundreds of hours of work by the many thousands of people that made possible the breakthroughs of yesteryear, each and every one of our accomplishments since is another small step taken toward the next giant leap for mankind.
Thank you for watching Space Doc. If you're interested in supporting the channel, please do check out the links on the screen right now or in the description below for our Patreon and channel membership services. Anything you can pledge goes towards improving our team and our equipment and allowing us to put together bigger and more exciting video projects for you guys on the channel.